everybody. Can I just say I love our church? <laughs> Truly, I do. I, I look at those videos, I'm like, man, I love all those faces and all those people that are there. And I'm just so honored to be able to be a part of this faith community, especially after this last week, um, mega sports camp. So many of you stepped up to serve and just be a part of the story that God is writing in our young people. If you served in mega sports camp in any capacity, would you just take a moment and stand up? Embarrassing you, but we want to take a moment and honor you. Thank you for all of the time and energy that you gave to serve our young people this week. These are important weeks. You can go ahead and take a seat. These are important weeks. And so that's why that we take today and we call it Tailgate Sunday. We want to celebrate all that God did this week. Um, but I was thinking about it and um, I was kind of laughing because this is Tailgate Sunday and I'm pretty sure I am the least sporty person on our staff. <laughs> Um, except for, I remembered, I won my March Madness bracket this year. Yeah. <laughs> I feel pretty good. Did I choose all the teams based on the colors of the jersey? Absolutely, I did. <laughs> but I also had Alabama losing, so there we go. Um, I do like sports. I'm not wearing a jersey. I actually don't think very many of you are wearing jerseys either, but we'll just skip past that part. Um, but my team, because I'm from Washington State, my team is the Seattle Seahawks. That's my team. <laughs> Yeah, um, and one of my favorite sports stories, I had to check and make sure that this was my favorite sports story, is I was in Disneyland um, when I was in college um, with some friends, and we were just walking through town, and my friend was wearing her Seattle Seahawks jersey because it's game day, and on game day, you wear your jersey. I couldn't find mine, and I'm not that sporty. But anyway, so we're walking through Tomorrowland, and this like little eight-year-old boy like comes running up. He's like, ma'am, 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 ma'am. I really like your jersey. Go Hawks. And we're all just like, uh, Thanks, go Hawks, before I can blink. It's like, go Hawks, go Hawks, go Hawks. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is very intense. And it was terrifying because you expect that at a stadium. A little bit out of context in Tomorrowland. <laughs> Not quite what I was ready for. Anyways, that's my sports opener for today. Um, before we get started, can we go ahead and just pray together? Lord Jesus. We thank you so much for your presence and the gift of your word. I thank you that we have the opportunity to gather together today in air conditioning. Um, I thank you for the gift that it is to be a part of a faith community. Um, we open our ears and our hearts to what you have to speak to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. So we've been working through the book of Acts since the beginning of the year, and we are only on chapter 13. So we got a long way to go, but we're getting to see the very early stages of the formation of the early empowered church. And we've seen some, a couple key turning points up to this point, right? Jesus has finished his earthly ministry, and he's ascended into heaven. The Holy Spirit came at Pentecost and, in, and empowered the early church, and Peter gave this dynamic, incredible message, and a bunch of people were saved. We're seeing the church starting to come together, and healings are happening. People are starting to believe that Jesus Christ is their Lord and Savior, and there's miracles that are happening, happening, and it's making some pretty big waves. It's getting people's attention, and with that has become some persecution, and Peter was just thrown in jail. If you remember this from last week, he was thrown in jail, but he was released from prison miraculously. We keep seeing these really incredible big things happen in the story of Acts. And our takeaway from last week was an empowered church is a praying church. So now we find ourselves in Acts 13. And I'm going to try and keep this as short as we can because Luke Jackson already took us to church. This is church round two, okay? So hang with me, hang tight. A few weeks ago, um, Pastor Ryan started to talk a little bit about um, X13, and I'm like sitting in the back over there. I'm like, bro, 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 you are taking my story. <laughs> but luckily, there's a lot we can talk about in X13. And so we're going to be looking at the second half of this chapter today. So if you open your Bible, you want to follow along. If you have your um, Bible on your phone, it's going to be really easy to find. It's the one that says X. A-C-T-S. Um, if you have your actual Bible, um, go ahead and turn about three quarters way through your Bible. If you get to the books that say Asians, gone too far. If you get to the books that say John and Mark, not gone far enough. It's somewhere in between there. Now, so at the beginning of Acts, of the chapter of Acts 13, um, we're taking a look at some different key players than we looked at last week. Last week, we really looked at um, Peter and um, the church that was in that area where he was in prison. Now we're back to focusing on Paul and Barnabas. 
And at this point of the story, they're still ministering together, and they have not parted ways. At the beginning of chapter 13, it tells about um, a local proconsul of Paphos. His name is Sergius, and how he was greatly impressed by the ministry of Paul and Barnabas. And if you want to learn more about what happened to that part of the story, you can go back a couple weeks ago. Pastor Ryan talked about this. Um, but this, th- that part leads us into the second half of Acts 13. And in the second half of Acts 13, they go to a totally new place. And scholars think that Sergius talked to Paul and Barnabas. He's like, hey, this ministry stuff that you're doing is super cool. Can you go tell my family about it in this really far away place? And they're like, yeah, sure, we got nothing else to do. And supposedly, it was not super easy to get there. Like, over the woods, through the mountains, really perilous kind of journey. Some commentators say it was a long and rugged journey. And lying as it did, almost entirely through rugged mountain passes, while rivers burst out of the bases of huge cliffs, or dashed wildly down narrow ravines, it must have been a perilous one. We don't get a lot of details, but I would love to know details about that. So we go ahead and take a look at verse 13. And again, this is a long little passage. Stay with me. We got this. We got this. Okay. Starting from chapter 13, verse 13. From Paphos, Paul and his companions sailed to Perga in, I'm not even going to try it, Pamphylia, where John left them to return to Jerusalem. From Perga, they went to Pisidian Antioch, and on the Sabbath, they entered the synagogue and sat down. After reading from the law and the prophets, the leaders of the synagogue sent word to them, saying, Brothers, if you have a word of exhortation for the people, please tell them. Standing up, Paul motioned with his hand and said, Fellow Israelites and you Gentiles who worship God, listen to me. The God of the people of Israel chose our ancestors. He made them prosper during their stay in Egypt, but with mighty power, he led them out of that country. And for about 40 years, he endured their conduct in the wilderness. And he overthrew seven nations in Canaan, giving their land to his people as their inheritance. And all this took about 450 years. After this, God gave judges until the time of Samuel the prophet. Then the people asked for a king, and he gave them Saul, son of Kish, of the tribe of Benjamin, who ruled for 40 years. After removing Saul, he made David their king. God testified concerning him, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, and he will do everything I want him to. From this man's descendants, God has brought to Israel the Savior, Jesus, as he promised. Before the coming of Jesus, John preached repentance and the baptism to all the people of Israel. As John was completing his work, he said, who do you suppose that I am? Am I not the one you are looking for? But there is one coming after me whose sandals I am not even worthy to untie. Fellow children of Abraham and you God-fearing Gentiles, it is to us that this message of salvation has been sent out. The people of Jerusalem and their rulers did not recognize Jesus. Yet in condemning him, they fulfilled the words of the prophets that are read every Sabbath. Though they found no proper ground for a death sentence, they asked Pilate to have him executed. And when they had carried out all that was written about him, they took him down from the cross and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead. And for many days he was seen by those who had traveled with him from Galilee to Jerusalem. And they are now his witnesses to our people. We tell you this good news. What God has promised our ancestors, he has fulfilled for us, their children, by raising up Jesus. As it is written in the second psalm, you are my son. Today I have become your father. God raised him from the dead that he will never be subject to decay. As God said, I will give you the holy and sure blessings promised to David. So it is also stated elsewhere. You will not let your holy one see decay. Now, when David had served God's purposes, in his own generation, he fell asleep and he was buried with his ancestors and his body decayed. But the one whom God raised from the dead did not see decay. Therefore, my friends, I want you to know that through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. 
Through him and everyone who believes is set free from every sin, a justification that you were not able to obtain under the law of Moses. Take care that what the prophets have said to you did not happen to you. Look, you scoffers, wander and perish, for I am going to do something in your days that you would never believe, even if someone told you. Paul and Barnabas were leaving the synagogue, and the people invited them to speak further about these things the next Sabbath. Paul, in this passage, is invited and given an opportunity to speak in this new town that some random person that he met in a totally different town asked him to go to. And he, at the beginning of this passage, has no idea how this is going to go. Maybe he has hope that it's going to go really well. And thankfully from our passage, it's going pretty well, right? So he goes, and he does what he normally does, and he goes to the synagogue on the Sabbath, and the church leader says, hey, if you have a word of exhortation for the people, please speak. This is not completely unlike what we've seen here today, right? We had Luke Jackson come to here and share with us as church leaders. We're like, hey, Luke Jackson, do you mind like coming and sharing uh, something? If you have something, an encouraging word to share with our body, with our faith community, would you share with us? This is a similar opportunity that Paul has. Paul and his crew, just uh, we kind of invited Luke Jackson. We were like, hey, Luke, you should come hang with us and talk at Mega Sports Camp and then talk on Sunday morning. It'll be super great and fun. Paul and his crew had no idea what they were getting into, and the, the church also didn't know that they were coming. They just showed up, and then this leader's like, hey, you extinguished guest, why don't you come on up and share something? If you have a word of exhortation for the people, please share. And Paul doesn't say, oh, I have nothing to say. Paul doesn't go, oh, well, like, you know, I kind of am like a cool person, and like, I kind of have a story. When Paul is invited to say something of substance, he tells the story of Jesus. Or as others would say, he preached the word. Paul took the opportunity at hand and was ready to say something. When we are invited to share, when we are asked about the faith that we walk, we need to be ready to share the story. In 2 Timothy 2.4, Paul tells Timothy, an upcoming church leader, preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, encourage with great patience and careful instruction. And I wonder if this piece of instruction from Paul to Timothy was specifically because Paul had been in many scenarios where he did not know how things were going to go. But he learned, hey, you got to be ready because you don't know when those opportunities are going to come. We don't know what opportunities are going to come up to us I don't know about you, but um, God does not always wake me up in the morning with like, hey, Rachel, when you're at Merritt Coffee today, you are going to tell somebody about Jesus. I don't know, maybe that happens to you. It does not always happen to me. We are not often, uh, we don't get a heads up oftentimes of the opportunities that we're going to have to talk about our faith. And so we need to be ready for when the opportunity arises, in season and out of season. For Paul, I cannot imagine a more seamless opportunity. Um, As we look at Paul's story through the rest of Acts, there's going to be times where he is not invited and he speaks anyway. There's times that he is specifically not asked to speak and he speaks anyway. This is like an open door, an invitation. Hey, please speak. Please share with us. I think there's something about that. When we are invited to share the story, when we are invited and asked It's a gift. When Paul is invited to share, what does he share? He shares a story. And I find it so interesting that this time when Paul shares is one of the first times that we really hear Paul like speak in front of people. He this is what he decides to talk about. Because this is this is why it's so interesting. If you if you've read a good chunk of the New Testament. In the Pauline letters and the letters that Paul has written, they're not necessarily in narrative story form. They're very much like deep theology, praxis. This is what you have heard, and this is how you are living it out, and this is maybe how you can live it out a little bit better. It's not a story, but some scholars believe that the reason that this passage is so important is this 
sermon would be the outline that Paul would use when he would go and speak at the first time at a lot of these churches or when he would be invited. This is the general structure of what he would share the first time. When it's point one, Paul's starting point is a story. Friends, we, we need to be really ready to tell this story. We need to be ready to be storytellers. And I know it's really easy for me to stand up here from a stage and be like, hey, you in the fourth row, you got to be ready to tell this story. Because when we're in real life moments and we're invited to tell, whoa, there is a bug. <laughs> Sorry, guys, Texas. Whoa. Anyways, moving on. When we're really <laughs> invited to like in these moments to share this story, it can be kind of nerve wracking, especially if we've never done it before. It might not be that much unlike um, when I played soccer in elementary school. Hang with me. So um, I played soccer in elementary school. My dad was the coach so that he could control when the practice times were. It was, really, it was a rough time for me as a kid. My dad was my pastor, my dad was my dad, and my dad was my soccer coach. I had a lot of therapy. Um, but I remember this one time, like, I had been playing for a couple years, and like, I, you know how the game of soccer goes at that point. My dad's been coaching for a couple years, so he knows how, how it's supposed to go, and I was playing as a forward. Right, And so for not, some of you not sports people, that means that your job is to get the ball into the goal, right? And so I got, I got the ball, and I'm like, this is, this is my time to shine. And I'm dribbling it, and I get up, and I'm faced with these defenders, and I'm terrified. Even though I've been in this situation before, every time I would get into the situation where I know I have to get the ball into the goal, I'm faced with this defender, and I'm terrified because when I was a younger kid... I um, was playing, with, uh, playing soccer with some kids, big kids, and I got hit in the face with a soccer ball by like an adult grown man. Boom! Right, soccer ball in the face. Um, and it kind of like scared me a bit, and so I'm, years later, I'm in this moment, and I'm just nervous, and I'm, and I'm kicking, I'm like, all right, this is my time. I know I gotta go. I know I gotta do this. But I'm terrified of this girl kicking the ball back in my face and hitting me in the face with a soccer ball. And I just remember that feeling of anxiousness of like, I don't know how this is going to happen, but I'm really, really scared if this goes wrong. And so sometimes when we're in these moments where we, we maybe see the opportunity that we have to share our faith or share about our journey with God or share about God, but if we haven't done it before, we're kind of scared that we're going to get hit in the face with a soccer ball. We might freeze up. And I think part of what we have to walk through is, is when we've never done it before, one, we have to be prepared, and two, we have to be super connected to the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is our empowerer in those moments. The first time, if someone was sharing their faith for the first time, I would be like, you need to be connected to the Spirit of God because the Spirit of God is going to give you that boldness. Just like he gave Peter the boldness to share his message for the first time when he had never done it before. But the other side of it is we actually have to think about what we would say if we had the opportunity to say it. How, have we actually thought about it? We see Paul and all that he shares and how he shares so frequently. And you know why he's so good at it? Because he's literally trained his entire life to be able to do it. Since he was a young kid, he had been trained and been learning about the things of God. And you're like, Rachel, I'm already behind. Like if Paul was talking and training his entire life, I am significantly behind. But the point of that is you don't need to be training your whole life to start crafting and creating your story and recognizing the times that God has met you and orchestrating that into a story that is ready for you to share with people when the moment comes. Many of the story of God, the story of Jesus, the experiences that we've had with God, but some of us need to learn not how to not just understand it, but to connect it with what the work of God is doing in our hearts and then be able to share it. The why story. In Deuteronomy 6, it says, in the future, 
When your son asks you, what is the meaning of all these stipulations and decrees and laws that the Lord has commanded for us to do? Tell him, we were slaves of Pharaoh in Egypt. The Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Before our eyes, the Lord sent signs and wonders, great and terrible, on Egypt and Pharaoh and his whole household. But he brought us out from there to bring us in and give us the land he promised on an oath to our ancestors. The Lord commanded us to obey these decrees and to fear the Lord our God so that we may always prosper and be kept alive, as is the case today. And if we are careful to obey all these laws before the Lord our God as he has commanded us, that will be our righteousness. In Deuteronomy, the Israelites are still figuring out how to do this whole freedom thing after being slaves for so long in Egypt. They now have all these laws and boundaries for how they are supposed to live life. And they know, and the reason that this verse is in here is they know at some point they're going to have to explain to people why they do the things that they do, particularly their children. But also, I think, the way that they did things, the way that God outlined for them to live was so different than the, how the rest of the world was doing things. Israel, why do you do things so differently than everybody else? Why do you Sabbath? Why do you only worship one God? Why, do you, why don't you eat pork? Because we used to be enslaved, and the Lord let us out, and now we are free. And so we live different. How do we explain how we live our life? When we're asked about the laws and the rules and the reasons, God tells us, tell them a story. Because the story should always inform what we do. Why, why do you only speak encouraging words to your coworkers? Why, why are you so honest all the time? Why are you so generous? One answer we could give, oh, it, it's, it's Jesus, which is accurate. A different answer might be, I I used to be one way, but I encountered a God who created the universe and died in my place and made a way for me to live whole and free again. And so now I live differently. That's the story we need to be telling people. Why do I keep using the word story? I'm sure if I went through my notes and like word counted the word story in this message, it would show up a lot. And you're like, you're saying the word story a lot of times, Rachel. What's the impact of story? Well, we first have to think about, we think of our own life in the terms of story, right? Stories bring coherence to our little pieces and bits of existence in our human life. Um, Our families have stories. Family stories define who we are. How many of you have an iconic family story that, like, you guys tell around the campfire, like, all the time? No? Just me? You guys don't have, like, family stories? Yeah, you guys have these stories um, help frame how we understand our family identity. We laugh. We reminisce. So my siblings and I, um, we often name our stories, um, our family story. They almost all the time include my dad. Um, and the one story that we have is called The Explosion. And um, it was 4th of July. Um, so let this be a cautionary tale to everybody else. Um, I was like, four, I had been like four years old. And my dad's side of the family and my mom's side of the family, and we went to the lake, and we were shooting off fireworks, and my dad was in charge of lighting off all the fireworks. He is significantly better than this now. Um, but what had happened was is he was on the dock lighting the fireworks, and the box of new fireworks was a little bit too close to the lighting off fireworks. Some of you are catching where this is going. And the sparks went from the lighting off fireworks into the box of new fireworks and lit all of them off at the same time. (laughs) Thank goodness there was a lake. And so, but all I remember in like my four-year-old brain is like this big explosion of like all these fireworks going off and we're all like booking it from the, they're like, oh my gosh. And my dad's dumping it into the lake. And now, 4th of July is very safe and very methodical, and we do things very differently. (laughs) Family stories give us a sense of identity within our close relationships. We laugh, and we bond, and we reminisce, and it reminds us why we love these people, and it reminds us why we're still alive in some cases. (laughs) Personal stories take up about 65% of our personal conversations. 
Think about it. We share stories to build relationships with new people. It's, a, it's kind of the way of explaining who we are. According to researchers, researchers and other really, really smart brain neuroscience people, when we are being told a story, things in our brain are a little, like change very drastic, dramatically. When we hear someone just like with a PowerPoint talk and just give you straight information, it's lighting, lighting up the language center of your brain. But when we begin to tell a story, a bunch of other areas of your brain are also lighting up. And I didn't write all of them down because it's very technical and a lot of big words I didn't quite know how to pronounce. But the, the crux of it is that we are wired to deeply connect to story. It's why Disney and Marvel and all these like movies and stories and books, like they make so much money because we're like, we want to feel connected to story. There's something about stories that deeply impact us. And as followers of Jesus, as believers, as the people of God, the story of God should deeply inform how we see our world, our faith communities, ourselves. This story of God that we read about in the Bible should inform a lot about us. And every time, we have to remember that every time that we tell the gospel, we're really sharing a story. So we need to be really good storytellers. This story informs our values, who we are, how we think, how we see people in the world around us. If it informs everything, then we need to be really good at telling it. I think based on Paul's words in telling the story, he wants the people um, at this church in Acts to know two things. One, what pr God promised in the old he has fulfilled. He says, we tell you good news. What God promised our ancestors, he has fulfilled for us, their children, by raising up Jesus. Through Jesus, we are forgiven and free, is his second point. Therefore, my friends, I want you to know that through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. That God fulfills his promises. And through Jesus, we are forgiven and free. I think these are the same two things that people in our world desperately need to know. And I think it's really important for us to remember that God gave us these truths in a story. He didn't just give us like a USB stick and download the information. I mean, I, I always think about that. That's kind of like an old illustration now. Like you couldn't like iCloud drop it to us, floppy disk it. No. <laughs> Jesus came and lived incarnate, a very real life that was written down and we read about it. And throughout that story, there's this thread through all of history and all of creation that God cares, that God sees, that God has been intricately involved in each and every moment of my life and your life in the life of humankind. And that God is still writing and you have a purpose and you have always had a purpose. And that there is a way to be whole again. This is the story that we tell. And why do we tell it? Because we find ourselves in this story that God is writing. This story says, God is for you. This is the basis of the good news that we share, friends. Pastor and author Rich Valadas says, God doesn't give up on them might be the singular theme of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Is that not the same theme in your life and my life? We find ourselves in a really great story that God is writing. And what a beautiful thing that we get to tell this story while we are in it. What a beautiful thing we get to tell people, God is for you, as we tell ourselves, God is for you. We get to tell people that God has not abandoned you. God has seen our mess, and he has a plan to restore everything back to how he intended. We get to tell people, in God there is hope. We need to know the story. We need 
need to know the story, not just in our head, but deeply in our hearts. I don't have this scripture um, on, on the screen, but this, this passage in Deuteronomy just so perfectly fit. In Deuteronomy 11, 18 through 21, in the message version, it says, place these words on your hearts. Get them deep inside you. Tie them to your hands and your foreheads as a reminder. Teach them to your children. Talk about them wherever you are. Whether you're sitting at home or walking in the street, talk about them from the time that you get up in the morning until you fall into bed at night. Inscribe them on your doorposts and the gates of your cities. Do we know this story like the back of our hand? Like the space between our eyeballs? How can we put the story of God at the forefront of our lives so that we don't forget it and we remember to tell it? As the empowered church, we so need to know the story we are telling, not just in our head, but in our hearts. So it doesn't matter if we have one minute and 30 seconds or an hour and 30 minutes, that we know the story that we're going to tell. I'm so grateful for Luke Jackson sharing his story with us today. And I love this thread that um, I think was seemingly unintentional for us for for Kevin at the very beginning of our worship transition saying that this is a commissioning service. Friends, this truly is a commissioning service that we need to know our story and we need to be ready to tell it and we need to know the story of God. If we are the people of God, we need to know that story. You're like, Rachel, um, I'm all in, but like, how do I get ready to tell this story? How do I figure out a way to tell the entire story of the Bible in a minute and 30 seconds? Because that's a lot of information. That's a lot of story to get through. And so if you don't know the story of the Bible well, I'd say a good place to start is simply reading your Bible because a good storyteller is a good listener. There's some really great resources out there like the Bible Project that begin to summarize um, some of the books in the Bible in like mere minutes. And if you're like, That's, I, I have more questions about how I can get to know the story of the Bible better, us as pastors, me, myself, Pastor Kevin, Pastor Ryan, and Pastor Jay, um, we want to be able to walk with you and tell you more of the story and help you craft the story in a way that is applicable for you to share it in your context. But if you really want to be ready to tell this story, you got to practice it. Talk about what you're listening to or reading in your Bible. And maybe you know the story in your head because you heard it over and over and over again, but you've never actually practiced speaking it or sharing it or telling it. And I know a really good place that you can practice doing that. Um, it's actually down the LH Kids Hall. My dad um, was a senior pastor up in Washington State, um, and whenever he would have a staff member that was interested in senior pastoring, he would make them the children's director, because he said, if you can tell the gospel to a third grader, you could tell it to anyone. And I happen to know that Liz Tate and her team are currently taking applications for the LH Kids Dream Team members. Shameless plug for her there. You might be like, hey, Rachel, um, how do I craft my God story? which is a super great question, and actually a question that I've gotten a couple times um, over this past year so far, especially these people love Jesus and, Jesus and have been walking with Jesus, and they're like, hey, I have this opportunity to share my story, and I have no idea where to start, because like, I don't have like, this big moment, and like, how, how do I begin to craft it or create it? Because I am walking with Jesus, and I do love Jesus, but I don't know how to say it, and I don't know how to communicate it. And I wanted to say a couple things for this um, because for people who love and follow Jesus, but you may not feel like you have a really big, like, major life change that will happen really, like, significantly or dramatically, and you're like, I don't know, I just don't think that my story is worth telling. That that is so not true. Because we have, some of our stories are stories of God's radical grace, where God does a major change in a really short amount of time. And some of our stories are stories of God's faithfulness, where God works a major change over a really long period of time. And both stories are beautiful examples of the love of God. So if you're trying to figure out how to craft your story, I'm gonna give you a super quick crash course with a couple questions to get you started. And I like to divide a story into three parts, because we have the before, 
inciting incident or conflict for you English majors out there, and the after. Before, number one, what was your life like before you had an encounter or a big moment with Jesus? Luke Jackson shared this with us today. He specifically, like, my life before was, and he talked about that. Number two, your inciting incident or your conflict, what moment or moments with Jesus changed you? What was that like? What did you learn about God? And number three, how were you different after? What changed and what was different? And I sometimes like to add a fourth space, which I call the and now section. Um, What is God taking you through now? What is he walking with you through now? Some of you might be like, hey, Rachel, um, I really want to tell my God story. But I've never had an opportunity where I've been able to share that story. I don't get to be on a stage like you do. So I just don't have those opportunities. And I would love to tell you, and I think this is so important for us to know, is our stories aren't always going to make it to a platform. And I think the more important space is that they're out there and we're ready to tell it to people who need it. We never know what, like before, we never know when those opportunities are going to look like and when they're going to arise. So if you want to be in a place where you're telling your story, start praying for opportunities. And be on the lookout for invitations. Because the story that God has written in your life is not just for you, but for other people to meet Jesus and so that they can see God moving and working in their stories as well. Start listening to the Holy Spirit. Because good storytellers are good listeners. If you want to be someone who leads people to Jesus, you need to be a person who really listens to the Holy Spirit. Well, what if I don't want to be someone who leads people to Jesus? Because, like, evangelism, like, isn't my gifting. If you are a person who really listens to the Holy Spirit, you will become someone who leads people to Jesus. This Holy Spirit thing, the Holy Spirit isn't just for us to be empowered and sit in a chair and stop and be here. The Holy Spirit isn't just for us. The Holy Spirit is the empowerer that we would go. And so if we're seeking the Holy Spirit and growing with what the Holy Spirit is doing in our life, the overflow of that is going to be telling our story and we want to tell our story and we're going to want to lead people to Jesus because that's just a side effect of listening to the Holy Spirit. When we listen and obey the, to the promptings of God, these are the, the kind of things that it leads us to. If we want to be Jesus' kingdom people, we have to be a people who listen to the Spirit. If we want to be the church empowered, we have to be a people that listen when the empowerer says, go and share. And... We need to be ready for it. After miracles happen, we need to be ready to look for God opportunities, to tell a God story, to show people that they can know God and be ready for God to work. We need to be ready for those miracles to happen because they are going to happen because God is on the move and at work. We need to be ready to tell a God story and be ready to show people that they can know God in their story. We need to have eyes to see where God is moving. And we need to have hands that are ready to get to work. Because we all are invited to be a part of the story that God is writing. Would you pray with me?